Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. I'm in the kingdom right now. But what he was saying, see, we think about things in terms of our mindset. But he's really in the idea, they're saying, the kingdom of God is not about meat offerings. It's not about drink offerings. It's not about divers washings. It's not about old covenant rituals and observations and divers washings. But what the kingdom of God is, it is righteousness, it is peace, it is joy, and it's located in the Holy Ghost. And if you've got the Holy Ghost, you've got the kingdom inside of you. Hallelujah. You've already seen shifted come on from an external form you have turned from a life of sin to a life that is lived from within hallelujah from a life that flows from an inner source the divine come on in the new covenant he don't just give you he don't just give a bankrupt humanity a bunch of rules he said what i'm going to do is this new covenant i'm going to write my law in your heart see under the old covenant it was thou shalt thou shalt not thou shalt thou shalt not thou shalt thou shalt not in the new covenant god said here's the covenant that I will make I will write my law I will remember your sins and iniquity I will I will I will I will and I will the old covenant is about what you are doing the new covenant is about entering into what God is doing man that's some good news to me so when I'm talking about repentance here in Matthew 3, I'm talking about a paradigm shift from an old covenant mentality to a new covenant mentality. And I'm talking about what we're doing is repenting. We're changing the way we think. And the moment we change the way we think, we access a new form of government. I'm telling you, there is so much in the kingdom of God that we thought we had to wait to over there to get. That if he ever, I'm telling you, the American church and literally around the world is waking up with a revelation that I'm right now a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a spout where the glory comes out. And if I can raise my understanding of what's already true about me, I'll begin to release the glory of what's happening in the heavens. I'll learn how to pray, Thy kingdom come. You your will be done in the earth as, and I'll start to access the miraculous. Uh, I'll start to access the healing. Jesus, when he walked this planet, demonstrated the free favors of the kingdom. He said, if I by the finger of God cast out devils and heal the sick, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Imagine what would happen if we could get a revelation tonight in this place of who it is that's living inside of me and the deposit of the kingdom of God that's inside of me. And we would begin to realize it's not just about a historic Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee 2,000 years ago, who's somewhere in a distant planet uh, who doesn't have any sense of what's going on here now. That's what we think about God. But when we begin to realize that this distant Jesus is not just on the planet three miles south of ours he came and took up his abode inside of you and I and when he did he brought everything heaven has to offer so that in this room tonight I believe as a company of miracle workers uh, that we can dispense and release the flow of the kingdom of God and release the kingdom everywhere we go yeah. hallelujah 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 Hallelujah. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited about seeing people begin to realize, you know what, I don't have, you know, and, and people just, you know, we, we get such concepts and ideas about the things of God. You know, we, we, we get things, you know, people say things like, well, you're not one of those prosperity preachers, are you? Well, I'm certainly not a poverty one. <laughs> you know, amazingly enough to me, in the years I've been in ministry, I think 34 years full-time, mobile ministry, planes, trains, and automobiles have been my life. But when I think about the power of the kingdom of God, when I think about the purpose of God in releasing people to flow in their giftings and see humanity touching creation set free by the power of God, I think about developing people and getting them to awaken to what's already true of them in their in their calling in the kingdom of God is that all right tonight yeah. hallelujah and what I, I just I think it's so powerful that what John is declaring I need to quit sidetracking here come back here but what John is declaring is we're in that shift we're in that shift if we can make the mind shift just not from see again again I found out in 34 years of full-time of a ministry let me say this what you preach 
is what manifests. Because faith comes by hearing. I have seen, you know, I have literally, I've been there, done that, been through almost every move, every, every, you know, trend. And, you know, I can remember when it was, when the move was, everybody was into deliverance. We preached on devils. And guess what happens when you preach on devils? Devils will show up. You give him a place, he'll show up. I, when you preached on suffering, we came through the message where everything was about suffering. God's going to pull you through a knot hole backwards. And the more you suffer, the better off you're going to be. If you suffer, you'll reign. And you know, I, you know, I don't even get it. I can preach the suffering message too. But when you when you when you preach suffering, suffering showed up. I just decided I'm going to preach favor. Yeah. Guess what's showing up? Yes, See, I came to declare favor here. Yeah. I said I came to declare favor. Yeah. Man, I feel the preacher. Jesus in his first public message. First time he ever got to preach in father's house. I'm telling you, he's 33 years old. He said, go get me the book of Isaiah. And they bring him the book of Isaiah. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel, which is the good news to the poor. Because if you preach the gospel to the poor, they will not be poor anymore. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. He said, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, and he's not talking again to drug dealers and prostitutes. He's talking to church folk because he's in the temple. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted because who more brokenhearted than people been to church their whole life under a message that didn't produce anything but disappointment and heartbreak. Somebody help me a little bit. He said, he sent me to, to, to set at liberty them that are bruised because who's bruised except ever to people who walk through a church door and every time they come, they get beat up and Come on, pounded on and browbeat. They're bruised. But Jesus said, he has sent me to declare the year of the favor of our God. Hallelujah. And he closed the book. And he didn't preach like their preachers. He didn't say some glad morning in the sweet vine by. He stopped. He said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We need some stuff that says this is that. That was spoken by the prophet Joel. Not some glad morning. We need some this is that preaching. And I'm convinced if we could get some this is that preaching, we won't have to worry about the future. See, if we can get folk living in the kingdom now, we won't have to worry about who goes to heaven, who goes to hell. If we can get you walking in the kingdom of heaven right now, it won't matter which side of the river you're on, you'll already be there. Come on, somebody. It takes all the fight out of it to me. It makes peace about it. Hallelujah. Jesus preached that. He said, you know what? I don't know if you know this or not, but he breaks Jesus. I'm not getting nearly as far as I want to. Jesus breaks hermeneutical rules when he preached that he closed the book he did not quote the full scripture if you go back to where jesus was preaching from the last part that he noticeably leaves out is he noticeably leaves out the part to declare the day of the vengeance of our god jesus did not preach that in luke chapter 4 he sent me to declare the favor come on somebody he didn't send. come on somebody he didn't send me to declare vengeance he sent me to declare the acceptable come on the year of favor the year of jubilee and he closed the book he said this day this scripture is fulfilled in your ears and the religious dudes their carnal mind went out of the safety zone last time jesus got to preach in their church but i came a long way to tell you i came to declare favor and when you declare favor favor shows up i, I don't care what the economy's doing I, I don't care if the government did shut down that's not the government i live under there's a government that's on his shoulders uh, hallelujah and while i believe there are very real problems uh, us cursing the darkness doesn't change anything but us right in the middle of it hallelujah being the government of god and the kingdom of god in the earth yes. hallelujah Say, I got a health care plan too. It's called healing. Hallelujah. I got a, come on somebody. I got a prosperity plan too. It's called the kingdom of God. I got an economic policy that says I've got a God, come on, uh, who's got a city that's built out of solid gold. Uh, somebody ought to get happy with me. Uh, hallelujah. I'm not, you know, I just think about simple things like if God plants a garden in the middle eastward in Eden and it's paradise and everything you need is divinely, come on, supplied and God puts a man in the middle of it and says, all you got to do is enjoy the journey. 
This is what Papa wants for you. It's to put you right in the middle of paradise. If you watch my Facebook about every couple of days, I always post something. Just another day in paradise. Because I found out it don't have to start when I get there. It found out what Jesus said to a thief on the cross. This day, you'll be with me in paradise because the cross reopened an opportunity through the finished work of the cross for us to live in a place of provision and blessing where we've been blessed to be a blessing and everything we need is a divine supply. Maybe you just got to go up to a tree and start accessing it. Come on, somebody, by changing the way you think. Man lost that dominion a few chapters later. They end up in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. God turns around and says to them in the book of Deuteronomy, He said, I want to give you the days of heaven on earth. That don't sound like poverty to me. And then He turns around and says, I want to bring you into a land that flows with milk and honey. That don't sound like a rough life to me. If I said to you without being deep or profound or spiritually heavy, because I could dig some real nuggets of gold out of that. But if I said to you, I'm going to bring you into a place that flows with milk and honey, that sounds to me like, unless I'm sadly mistaken, that sounds to me like the good life on every level. So why would it surprise us when Jesus gets up and says, hey, here's my intention for you. I came to declare favor. I came to tell you, come on somebody, that God is not mad with you. He is mad about you. I came to tell you that he's your father and he cares about you and your destiny. And if God so loved the world, come on, that if God did not spare his only son but freely gave him up for us all. If God did not hold back his son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things. If God loved us enough to give His Son, what makes you think He'll hold back healing? What makes you think He'll hold back reconciliation in your family? What makes you think He would hold back finances? Somebody change the way you think and access the flow from the kingdom in this place right now. It's the way we think that has to change. Hallelujah. It's a paradigm shift away. I believe God wants to bless favor everywhere you go. You know, one of the things I've seen happen is I've declared favor is I've seen God bless people. I've seen healings come. I've seen buildings given. I, 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 listen, I can tell you about prophetic words, different places we've been where we declared the word of the Lord and, and, and spoke a word. I spoke one on Sunday night in Arizona that God was going to bless them with land and with buildings and provision and favor. I said that on Sunday night. I got on a jet on Monday morning before my plane landed in Baltimore. I had a message on my cell phone. The pastor called me. He said, you're not going to believe this. He had already, I said, try me. I called him back immediately. He said, man, you, he said, brother, this, this, you, you're not going to believe this. I said, try me. He said, there's a guy on his way from Los Angeles right now to sign over three city blocks to us absolutely free of charge and the city has already given us grants to tear down the buildings where it even going to cost us anything to get the property ready that church has doubled in one year they're about to build another facility it is amazing what god has done i could tell you of another guy prophesied over last october not not this october but last october that god was going to give them a new building they within three months the church within several blocks of them called him and said, look, we have got this huge facility, gymnasium, seat 400. He was having two services a day. And man, he began to, uh, you know, I said, the Lord's going to give you favor, begin to declare favor over them because it was the word of the Lord. And this church called him and said, we're just struggling. We've got a handful of people. We barely keep the doors open. They were going to, they, look, he went to the lawyer's office. They're going to sign this church over to him for one dollar. He gets there and finds out they can't even sell it to him for one dollar that their bylaws say hallelujah that you can't sell it for anything you have to give it to him and so he didn't even cost him a dollar for a multi-million dollar facility i could take you to another place in georgia and show you a building 53 acres lake campground on it a huge auditorium, they'll seat several thousand, a gymnasium, they'll seat several thousand, kitchen facilities, Sunday school, educational properties, paved parking lots, lighted signs, I mean the whole shooting match, 53 acres, and the pastor buys 53 acres for $1.3 million, you couldn't even pour the concrete for that. That's favor. 
I don't know why you're all this quiet. I'm still I'm talking about favor. See, I believe if I get you to... And I'm not just preaching favor in those dimensions. I'm telling you, the more we preach the favor of God, the more we see the miraculous begin to take place. Let me try to get one, one other piece here because I'm starting, to, I'm starting to run out of time. When John the Baptist is about to take Jesus down into the River Jordan, something caught my attention. Now, like I said, there is inexhaustible the things that I've shared. There is a series out on the table called Elijah and Elisha that's about eight CD messages on just Elijah and Elisha in the river. There are two other series out there called The Kingdom of God, is accessed by repentance. There's one out there called the government affirmation. So I've done a lot of teaching and a lot of it is already in here. I'm only after a few pieces here tonight. But what, there's a, what I'm simply saying that for is to tell you there's a lot going on in this River Jordan. But something caught my attention. When Jesus is about to walk down over the bank of the Jordan River, John the Baptist looks up and he sees the king of the kingdom now on the grand scene of human existence. And he points to the king and said, right there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has not got it out of his mouth yet. The kingdom of God is within your grasp. It's within your reach. And all of a sudden, here comes the king of that kingdom. Jesus walks down over the bank of the Jordan River. And John the Baptist looks up at him and he says, I have need to be baptized of you and comest thou to me and Jesus says this and this is what really started keying some of this into me he said suffer to be so because we must fulfill all righteousness so he suffered him and he baptized Jesus what I got to thinking about is did Jesus need to be baptized for the remission of his sins I don't think so because he didn't have any sin so I'm thinking, what, what's going on here? Man, the Lord began to take me someplace. Look, go, go to Joshua 3. We're, we're getting there. We're going to be okay. We'll just quit here in a few minutes and pick up tomorrow. Go to Joshua 3. Joshua chapter 3. I think it's incredible that the book of Joshua opens by saying, Now Moses... My servant is dead, and he gives way to Joshua. Now, let me say to you that, that to me powerfully pictures the transition from Old Covenant Moses to Yeshua. Joshua is the Hebrew name of Jesus. So we're transitioning from law to grace. Can you see the possibility of that in this chapter? We're moving, come on, out of bondage into a promised land. Chapter 3 says, And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim, came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. And when they commanded the people saying, watch this, watch this. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. I'm going to read that again. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go. Heretofore, for you not passed this way before. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant, pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, went before the people. And, and the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests to bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When you are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, say, Jordan, you shall stand still in Jordan. Say, Jordan. Jordan. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby shall you know the living God is among you, that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanite, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and the Termites. I guess that wasn't in there. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passes over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribe of Israel, every man a tribe, out of every tribe a man. And it shall come to pass that as soon as the souls of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord 
of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto the Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the, into the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks all the time of harvest, that the water which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap, very far from the city of Adam, that is, beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho, and the priests that bare the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were clean, passed over. Now let me take a few more minutes. I don't know if you see the picture or not. I was reading this part where it says, and Jesus looks up to John the Baptist, who is standing in the river Jordan. Say Jordan. Jordan. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. Man, I, I'm so full, I don't know how to unravel all this. Do you know John the Baptist is the son of Zechariah? So he's a Levitical priest. You say, what's the point? Because Joshua said, when you see a priest, a Levite, That's good. That's good. carry an ark into the river Jordan, you're going to know it's time to cross over. I, I wish you'd get as excited as I am about this. Because how many know John the Baptist was the Levite and Jesus was the ark? What are you saying? I'm trying to tell you this is a powerful picture that Moses, my servant, is dead. And this happened 2,000 years ago. What that does is slaps me in the face and says, how long will you live on this side of Jordan? You could have crossed over 2,000 years ago and been living in your promised land right now. Because Hebrews 4 tells you that the promised land is not a piece of real estate across the ocean. The promised land is rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And when you get in Christ, you are in your promised land. And when you get in his rest, it will flow like milk and honey. Life will flow out of you. Hallelujah. Like a divine flow that flows out of a land that flows with milk and honey. Man, that's good news to me. And I begin to hear the Lord say, the priest, the Levite, carried. not only was he the priest, the, hallelujah, carrying an ark, but Levi, was he, John the Baptist, was the last of the Levitical priesthood. And the reason they're in the water is because if you're going to inaugurate and ordain another priest, he had to be washed in the water. So here's John the Baptist, who was the son of Zechariah. He's a Levite, and he's carried the ark in the river, but he's not only carried the ark, he's about to introduce the new priest. Because Levi is about to give way to Melchizedek, because there's another priest coming on the scene, after the order of Melchizedek, which is a new covenant priesthood. How did, he's a king priest. And I love it, but the book of Hebrews declares this, for if there is a change of priesthood, there must of necessity be a change of the law. So what that tells me is if John introduced a new priest, he's introducing a new law, he's introducing a new king, he's introducing a new, come on somebody, hallelujah, a new covenant, he's carried the ark in the river, he said it's time to cross over. It's time to cross over out of an old covenant and into a new covenant. Yeah. I'm a mess, hallelujah. I feel the preacher on me a little bit. I, I get passionate because what happens is here we are 2,000 years into the new covenant. You say, well, you know, they said, you know, let me just say this. He told me when you see the ark and the priest carry the ark, you see the priest bearing the ark. He said, follow it 2,000 cubits. You, you could use that probably if you wanted to as 2,000 years. But what I really discovered was that 2,000 cubits was the length you could go on a Sabbath day's journey. So what he's simply saying is not somewhere out in the distant future. What he was saying is what happens is when you get a, a revelation of the finished work of Jesus that it brings you into rest and you enter into God's rest, what happens is the moment you come into rest, you enter into your Sabbath day. Somebody help me a little bit. I mean, John the Baptist said he must increase and I 
must decrease. Can I say it another way? That old covenant had to begin to fade and wax old and roll together like a great scroll. But another covenant was emerging. Another government was forming. The king of the kingdom was on the scene. The kingdom had now come on planet earth. And everywhere Jesus went, he went demonstrating the kingdom. Hallelujah. Because God's goal is not just to get you from here to there. It's to get what's happening there to operate here. And if somebody will believe it, if we can shift the way we think, if we can metanoia, if we can repent, the kingdom is within our grasp. Hallelujah. Let me get you another very quick scripture. 1 Corinthians 10. I'll come back and probably pick some of this up tomorrow night. It says, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 11 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not, you should be ignorant, how that our fall of our fathers were under the cloud. And all of them passed through the sea, and all were baptized under Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Did all eat the same spiritual meat. They did all drink the same spiritual rock, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples. Listen, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them as it is written. This people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed fell in the one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and destroyed by the serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Watch this. Now all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The Greek word for world here is age. The Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth says this, everything that happened to them in type and shadow happened to them as an example upon those people we see when we read Corinthians we say upon us upon whom the end of the world is come and we think he's talking about the end of some global situation which is the Greek word for age and we think it's the end of this age but it, Paul was not writing to us he was writing to the church at Corinth and he was saying to them these things were written for our examples upon whom the end of the age had come they had come to the end of the age of the law and what Paul was saying is everything that happened to them by type and shadow was only an example for them so that we ought to be at this point where Paul's talking to them he's beginning to declare to them don't miss this promise for anyone struggling to understand John's writings in Revelation, this book provides true, biblically-based answers. Through detailed insights into the letters John wrote to the seven churches of his day, you will learn how to avoid the mistakes of the early church to overcome today's trials and tribulations. This book will provoke you to thought and dialogue, bringing greater clarity and revelation of Jesus Christ.